But as long as you stay in treatment, as long as you keep trying, you'll eventually find help. You'll eventually help yourself. Don't measure your success only by total abstinence. People forget, like, when you cut back, you've done good. You've helped yourself. You've helped your loved ones. That's a step in the right direction. You know, give yourself those kudos as you go along so that you keep trying, so that you don't just walk away and give up. It's always worth finding somebody you can trust, both lay person and professional. So you stay, stay in treatment. That's the bottom line for me. Stories are powerful. Powerful. Welcome to the Rise, Recover, Live podcast brought to you by The Phoenix. This is a space where people impacted by substance use can come to share their story of strength and resilience, get open and honest, and inspire hope and build community through shared experience. We'll be talking to people in our community on their own recovery journey and shine a light on the topic of recovery in all its forms. Maybe you'll hear some of your story in theirs. Let's show the world that together we rise, recover, and live. Welcome back to the show. I am Bryce the Third. He, him pronouns. And I am Liz McKean. She, her pronouns. And why exactly are we here on the front end of this episode, Liz? <laughs> we are here because I was so lonely in this episode interviewing this um, this wonderful person, Michael Fiore, without you. And I just wanted our listeners to be able to hear your voice before we hopped in to the episode, which I think you're going to really enjoy because I had a great time talking to Michael, but I just wanted to make sure that your voice was heard because you are just an incredibly important part of this podcast Um, team. um, (laughs) You know, and I do want to plant the seeds for for all the listeners that um, I, uh, I fully trust Liz to be able to carry this show and represent Bryce the third when Bryce the third is not there and I know she trusts me to represent Liz when Liz is not there and we both trust each other to represent the organization of the Phoenix in this cool ass community that we built together Mm -hmm. and so you know as we continue to push out content and the content shape shifts and and becomes what it what it becomes there'll be episodes where Liz isn't there or Bryce isn't there because we are uh, involved in a lot of different initiatives but know that we always will keep the foundation of this show at heart and at mind as we show up and activate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, we trust all of you to be out there talking about recovery and the show and Phoenix as much as feels good for you because we're all in this together. And yeah, even when we're apart, we're still representations of of what we're all doing, all this good in the world. A bunch of ripples, ripples mm-hmm. out there. Mm-hmm. Gotta love it. So with mm-hmm. all that being said, this is the last time you'll hear from me on this episode and let's get into the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Rise, Recover, Live podcast. And I am here on my own today without my my BFF, Bryce, and with the world's most patient guest in the entire world, Michael Fiore, or Fiore rather, who is a doctor. Um, and, you know, we're just going to hop right into it because we've tried this a few times and I don't want to test your patience any more than I already have. So welcome, Michael. How are you today? Thank you. Thank you. Great. I'm glad to be here. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Yeah, no, I'm glad to be, be here. And uh, I'm used to technical snafus. We <laughs> just have to live with them now. So We do, yeah. And we yeah. had talked, to, talked briefly before, before technology yeah. decided to just shut us right down, a little bit about that. And if you don't mind talking a little bit again about what it is that that you do and and how you got to this point um, career wise, because I know you have okay. an extensive background and it definitely has a lot to do with what we talk about here on this podcast, but from a little bit of a different angle than we've talked about in yeah. previous episodes. Yeah. So we're excited to get to know you. Well, you know, I, I I'm working in this telepsychiatry space now. Uh, I was really lucky to hook up with this organization called. Psychiatry, uh, clever. And, yeah, <laughs> it's terrible. I'm not sure it's the best name in the world. Uh, it's memorable. I love it. Uh, I think it's great. But you know, they uh, their attempt is to try to get people access to treatment and and in a way that they can use their insurance. So right, there's lots of blockades to treatment today. I am treating outpatients now. I I have a general psychiatry practice, but of course my years of experience working with people struggling with various forms of substance use 
uh, disorders prepared me for this. You know, when, when you're practicing general psychiatry, you're practicing a lot of trying to help people who have substance use issues that they can go hand in hand, as, as we all know. Yeah, I would imagine probably more than you even necessarily get to know about on the surface. I, I know that I personally just went for a lot of mental health support for years when my substance use was a major problem that I wasn't telling anybody about. Right. Is that something you come right. across? Oh, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that I can ask people questions as I take their initial history in a way that they understand this is a, which I guess you might call it a no judgment zone, you know, a non stigmatizing, no, no judgment way of asking questions that. So if you feel comfortable telling me, and sooner or later people will tell you the truth, but it, it, the people feel very truthful to me. I mean, I, I, I always believe people are telling the truth to begin with. It yeah. comes out later that I'm wrong. That's okay. Uh, but that's where I, that's where you start. Yeah. Well, uh, what else are you going to do? I feel like it would be really hard to do your job if you were coming at it from just an assumption that everyone was lying. Right. Right. Cynicism is not helpful in this line of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 How do you avoid uh, it after all these years of working with people? That's a good question. You know, for years I did the inpatient dual diagnosis work, detoxing people and trying to get start to evaluate their psych issues. I do think it's definitely a risk. The, the idea of burning out temporarily, the idea of people use the term of, you know, trauma a little bit almost too freely today. But when you're treating people who are suffering so and are in such vulnerable states, you have to be careful. It's a balancing act. You have to stay open and receptive. And yet it can be pretty hard hearing, uh, that, you know, how do you, how do you stay fresh? How do you stay uh, resilient and open? That's a real thing. That's true. For, I, th I think probably for all doctors, but certainly if you work in the substance use space and you see what people are going through and, uh, and they're, they're in their most vulnerable states and uh, it's really important to take it for the providers to take yeah. care of themselves. You can get hurt. You can get numbed. And then you, you're, it's not good for the provider. It's not good for the patients. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's something to the whole, you know, put on your oxygen mask first because you're no good to yes. anybody if you're not taking care yeah. of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, yeah. And that's not always the, that's not always what comes naturally. I think when you're in a helping profession and you're just used to yeah. showing up for everybody totally. else. Yeah. That's, that's right. How has that, right. how has that changed for uh, you? Cause, I mean, cause you've been practicing for how many years now? Uh, I became a physician in 1981. I was an intern. Wow. Uh, so when you yeah, were just a yeah. child. <laughs> I was just a child. I was too young to oh have gosh. that responsibility. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you, if you go right through, you know, college to medical school, you come out, you're young. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so I was, uh, I felt for the responsibilities that I was uh, carrying forth, I was, it's a rapid curve of, of learning uh, yeah. and maturing. Yeah, uh, I would imagine. Yeah. Did you yeah. find that you, like, as you learned and, you know, obviously how to treat people in, in the ways that you learned with, with doing, yeah. how did that self-care kind of evolve your own, your own just taking care of you? You know, it starts off, I guess, certain amount you, you, you've, you've started in college. I guess you start, you know, as a child with your parents teaching you, you know, you really start consciously being mindful of taking care of yourself and more in college and then in medical school and uh, and it just keeps growing i think as you as you get older you just realize the absolute imperative that in psychiatry the psychiatrist is sort of a tool uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know a human being but a tool trying to help people get get better and uh if you become conscious that oh if i'm if i'm becoming numb if it becomes in any way rote that's going to get communicated that's in yeah. some way shape or manner 
And that's not good. How did you get into this work? I, I know you, I, we have a lot to talk about as far as just this work in general, but I just am interested to hear, you know, like you started young, you know, so what was your yeah, connection yeah. to yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I think when I started, I think I carried a lot of the prejudices that many physicians carry. My first love was not working with people who had severe substance use issues. I'd started out, I was an academic, then I decided I didn't have the temperament to really be an academic uh, of the deepest dye. Uh, so I, I stayed within the world of academics, but really became a clinician. And then I was doing private work, you know, with a large practice of, we, we had a lot of psychiatrists. And then when I came back to Brown uh, in, in, in Providence, I had the opportunity to cover a fellow who was running the dual, the dual diagnosis unit. And, and I was amazed at uh, how revitalizing it was and how fascinating I found it. And that was like in 2000, yeah. uh, which is a long time ago now. Uh, isn't that was weird? Right before, <laughs> yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. And the only way I know that is because I was, you know, on the unit seeing a patient when my head social worker came in to tell me that the towers were collapsing oh my gosh. Uh, in, in New York. So that's how I know I started in 2000. It was right yeah. before. Whew. Anyway, from then on, it changed my calling. It changed the emphasis. It changed my, and I, so that began a growth into learning and understanding about uh, substance use disorders and their interaction with uh, psychiatric disorders all within the same person. Uh, yeah. and, uh, so, and then that became my love. That's so yeah. interesting, man. So you've been in this field through, I mean, some of the hardest things, like I'm just, I'm thinking of people who I know who can clock back there, you know, when their substance use got bad, like around the times of some of those landmarks, like we've talked about, you know, you being in New York during um, COVID and being in New York um, for 9-11. And like, I mean, that is, did do you, from the clinical side, did you see like the surge of people needing support after those events as much as oh my. those of us needing support uh, felt it? <laughs> you know, I... At the time that uh, for for nine eleven, I was in Providence, Rhode Island, so I was a little bit separated from it on a very personal level. I was profoundly affected. I I lost a loved one there, my my brother. Oh, and, so sorry. Uh, but I have lived through a lot of things. I didn't even realize the connections. I mean, when I started out as a young doctor, it was the beginning of the AIDS crisis. We, we didn't even call it AIDS at that time. And, you know, drugs became a real part of that. They were, they were part of the problem. You know, if you fast forward to 2020, when COVID hit, the demand for services, and already psychiatrists and therapists, there are not enough of us anywhere near enough to meet the, the needs. And well, things went up by well over 30% with COVID. You know, I was joking about myself having to come into work all the time. and But I began to realize that it was affecting different segments of the population in different ways. Yeah. Uh, and younger people took a much bigger hit than uh, middle-aged and older. But then the elderly took a tremendous hit as they got completely isolated. Uh, so different, it, it affected different segments of the population differently. But Bottom line, this, the demands for psychiatric and substance use services skyrocket. Yeah. Gosh. I can't. Yeah, man. I, you know, it's so interesting to look back because you just see it through your own lens, you know, your own kind mm -hmm. of like life timeline and how it affected you and you as in that position, you certainly saw it through a lot of people's lenses and yeah. Speaking of a lot of lenses, yeah. Um, yeah. just to rewind back to, you know, you were there when when the AIDS crisis started happening. And I know that's when a lot of conversations, I think, 
around the this was like the first time that really harm harm reduction became part of yeah. the conversation. What was that like to be around for those conversations? To be treating people during that time for both substance use and and folks that were just scared. Yeah, well, I think that we were scared too. Meaning, meaning the physicians mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the first patient I had. Again, we didn't call it AIDS, but there's. You know, I'm working him up and working on I couldn't understand why he kept getting fevers and getting weak. And uh, I was a psychiatrist. He was on my unit because he had gotten psychotic. You know, the the, the virus goes oh, to the wow. brain back b- before we had medicines. Now it, it doesn't as easily go to the brain because our treatments are effective. But mm. So I'm doing blood uh, draws, b- blood cultures, spinal tap. So I was, a, I was an intern. I had the nervous habit back then of biting my cuticles uh, on my fingers. And we didn't wear gloves back then, or I didn't. Uh, it was a different era. Yeah. And uh, so the blood would get onto my into my cuticles and where I, you know, didn't, I didn't think anything of it. Right. And then years later, as we understood how this was transmitted and so on, and, the, you know, I got, I was really scared. You know, I went and got tested and was negative, uh, luckily. And it was, you know, it was, it was a lot of naivete, my, my, my fears, but yeah, it was, that was something to live through and, yeah. and, and awful. And you, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing that now AIDS is a chronic disease. It's mm-hmm. not, it's not a death sentence, uh, yeah. by any stretch. I don't know if everybody knows that though. You know, I, I mm-hmm. I've had, you know, seen folks have scares without that knowledge. Like, I think that's, it's still seen as that. And that's, you know, a a stigma, I I think is is probably where that's going. Yeah. 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 It's, it's complicated, you know, because it's so serious and we want people to take it serious. We want them as part of harm reduction to -hmm. protect themselves, uh, from both all all the communicable diseases and hep C and, and HIV. So we want people to take it very seriously. On the other hand, we want people to know it is not a death sentence with treatment. Yeah. People go on and live uh, normal, full lives. Yeah. Uh, thank God. Yeah. It's a big, it's, a, it's an unbelievable change. It uh, is. Yeah. Well, it's not a death sentence and it's also not a moral failing, which I think, you know, is, is Hello. Yes. a perfect transition into, you know, substance use disorder with or without that as part of the conversation. That mm-hmm. um, I know that's something that you and I talked about briefly is how, that is how that's how it's looked at. You know, that's I know that's why I didn't get help for a really long time because I was sure I was just a terrible person and there was just something very wrong yeah. with me that wasn't fixable and I didn't yeah. deserve to have it be. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Where do we start? Where to uh, begin? <laughs> yeah, I think that stigma prevents people from getting treatment. Yeah, and, but, and this it flows on both sides of the treatment. It's it's a lot more than a dyad, but thinking of it as a dyad between the patient and the provider, there's so much internal misunderstanding for people who struggle with with this illness, and there's so much misunderstanding on many of the docs and nurses and other folks who are involved in providing care. It's a just a huge part in the training of all the providers that we have to look at our personal reactions, our personal thoughts and feelings and how do they interfere with our giving good care yeah the most basic thing i know Uh, but it it is it's so i'm excited that you're a person who works with um people who you know are having who've experienced a substance use disorder because most people i think that that work with folks like like me have experienced uh the thing that i have and that's a beautiful thing because that is um you know that that shared experience has so much value but it also kind of sections us off i think and i feel like it is it's something that can be cared for on by anybody yeah because you know, it's, it's not, it's not a moral failing. It's not something unfixable. I think you, you had mentioned like the disease model being like a helpful framing for the way you've talked about that before. How does that, how how would you define Uh, that? So that's, that's an interesting thing. By the way, if we just go back for one second to the uh, stigma and how physicians and therapists and nurses, how, uh, when we're not at our best in in our thoughts and our regard uh, for people who, who have substance use disorders, you know, patients feel it. 
and yeah. they 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 feel it, and they're in an incredibly vulnerable position. They they're very sensitive to being uh, looked down upon or mm-hmm. insulted by the. So, what this is a, a plug for more people to come into providing care for people with substance use disorders, and that is is it, the patients are so grateful. Uh, uh. It's so rewarding to the provider. Uh, all you have to do is like be honest and real and kind mm-hmm. and understanding and, you know, and knowledgeable. But, you, you know, as long as you are not looking down on the pit, they're like so not used to that. They're so grateful. And then the treatment rolls, you know, from from that point, yeah. uh, from that position, from that relationship. Uh, yeah. Anyway, just that's just a plug for more people to come into the field. I love, yeah, no, thank you for saying that. It's so yeah. true. It's because I, I know, and, and honestly, like I think for, for the outsider, they might not always know how much the person who's experiencing that is already coming down hard on themselves. Like we're the right. harshest judges of ourselves. Like we, yeah. man, especially when you get to that place of desperation where you're reaching out and asking for help when you're being honest, like yeah. there's, yeah, that comes with so much fear and vulnerability yeah. and self yeah judgment and um yeah so to have someone look at you someone you know that you respect who's, who's a doctor who, who potentially could help to look at you and see a human is yeah, um yeah, yeah there's yeah. not even words for what a gift that is you you mentioned the idea of the medical model or the disease model or the using the analogy to medical illness as a model for just beginning to wrap your arms around substance use disorders mm-hmm. yeah i find that very helpful because, you know, psychiatry is a complicated field. The brain is phenomenally complicated. And then, you know, how people behave when they're in the throes of substance use disorders gets so complicated. And you're struggling to understand where the substance use disorder begins and ends, where the psychiatric issues, how are they related to the mm-hmm. substance use disorder? And, you know, it gets it gets so complicated. Yeah. Uh, and then people feeling like, how can this be? How how could I get this? How I, you know how did I come to to have this illness? Like that's these are profound, complicated questions that have to do with everything from their genetic lineage to how they were brought up to what they were exposed to. But then you take something that is complicated but much simpler, uh, like uh, type two diabetes or hypertension. And these things are di- directly analogous to substance use disorders. You know, all the behavioral choices that people make, all of the need for lifestyle uh, adjustments, how when all those things, if they're not sufficient, then, well, you consider using medicine uh, to, to help in addition to all the other things. That's what we do. We're all used to that in the world of the treatment of diabetes and blood pressure. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's very analogous. And we don't doubt whether of, someone deserves that treatment. We don't doubt whether hello. someone like <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Though though in all fairness, there's a big prejudice against people who are obese. Uh, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not as severe as the prejudice against people who have substance use disorders, but there is a prejudice against against them in society and to a certain extent within the medical world too. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I yeah, I definitely I've I've seen that happen in real time. I worked in the health in healthcare for um some years before um I decided that it was not good for my recovery. And uh-huh. I I know I saw it happen where someone would come in for, you know, pain or maybe a mental health challenge or like a whatever. And Mm -hmm. yeah, if you were overweight, the first thing would be go home and lose weight and then come back and then let's talk about it. And it was like, this is, that has nothing to do. Like I have a a hurt, you know, leg or something like that. It's just such a ridiculous thing to say to somebody. And yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting comparison because it is your brain's part of your body, right? You got it. And, And you know, the brain completely informs the you know the mind completely informs the body and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, so that's totally true for all of us, 
And it's, you know, you have to think about that stuff when you're trying to help someone with a psychiatric problem and a substance use problem. Yeah. Does that help the patient too, to compare it like that? Is that something that is more just for, you know, with, as a professional with other professionals, or is it like, if I come to you as a patient with this, with this thing? Oh, I, I think with? it's good for, for, for both of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it helps to keep the providers thinking, have a little bit of clarity. And I think it's good for the person who's coming in for help because it's destigmatizing. Yeah. Uh, right. And it's, it, hopefully takes away some of the shame. It, it, it really does seem to and makes us all a little more comfortable talking about it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, always, that's really helpful for me. You know, I know there's a lot of different conversations out there about, you know, is it alcoholism as a disease or, you know, whether there's the hereditary or, you know, all the, all the, all the conversations. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of separate mm-hmm. from what we're talking about, which is really, like you said, just an analogy, like there's, there's kind of no arguing that where it's just like, you know, this is something that you would treat because this part of your body, this is something you would treat because this is part of your body. And like your, right. um, right. you know, the substance use disorder is, is, you know, and the person experiencing that is just as worthy of that loving treatment as that's right. the person that's with a broken right. leg. That's right. Yeah. And you know, they would be worthy of the treatment, even if there was no, there were no genetics involved and yep. there's no genetic vulnerabilities or predispositions. But it does seem to help people to make that clear that, hey, you know, you, <laughs> it's a ridiculous idea. I say it almost lightheartedly, but you came by this honestly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you know, your father, your mother, your grandfather, uh, yeah. you know, uh, that it helps people to, again, to feel a little more comfortable, a little less ashamed and, and lock into treatment and, and to be honest, what's going on. Yeah. How do you, this, I don't know if I'm going to word this correctly, probably not, yeah. but how do you balance that? Um, and there might not even be an answer that mm-hmm. not that if this isn't your fault, but this is your responsibility, you know, cause I yes. feel like it's easy for those to become unbalanced and that's often where where we come in, what's where I came into treatment, which this is all my fault, all my responsibility, and that's too heavy and I can't do it. As opposed to like, maybe it's not all my fault. Maybe it's not even all my, maybe somebody can help me with this. I don't know where that balance lies. This is going to come at your question uh, sideways. Uh, <laughs> the spouses and family members and so on, they want the person to guarantee that they will <laughs> never fill in the blank, you know, drink yeah. again, shoot up again, whatever. And the person can't do that. You know, they can't, but they can guarantee I'll stay in treatment. They can guarantee that I'll stay in treatment and I'll be honest. And when I'm not honest, I'm going to call myself out on it. Like those are things that are reasonable to dedicate. When You can dedicate to trying to achieve sobriety, to going into recovery. You, You can say to somebody, look, I'll stay in treatment. I'm not going to drop out of treatment. And I'm going to stay honest in treatment. That's the responsibility of the patient. And if if the provider and the system trying to provide care can give them that opportunity, then that I think that's that's a huge help to the person and the people who love that person. Yeah. And that's uh, an enormous yeah. thing to be celebrated too. Gosh, to be honest. Yeah. That's hello. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. But part of treatment is getting people to recognize. You know, when when they're talking, they say, "Oh, wait, that wasn't true," and pull it back. Yeah. And, you know, like that, like because you get so used when you're actively using, you get yeah. so used to lying that as you go into recovery, you start trying to, you know, live by the truth. That's a whole, it's a whole new thing. But it's a red yeah. flag when you find yourself not telling the truth. You know, yeah. you're in trouble. You may not have used yet, but you know, you're 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 moving in the wrong direction. Yeah, definitely. That's one of those, it's like, I guess, a gift and a curse of recovery. Because I think it's a gift in that I I feel like a lot of people probably get in that habit, you know, because we're all just trying to feel better (laughs) in a million different ways. You know, substance use disorder is one that is pretty hard to, um, to hide, you know, so eventually anyways. And I, I feel like I see that happen in, you know, a lot of people that that I, that I know and love where, you know, you can tell when someone's not taking great care of themselves when they start being yes. um, dishonest with themselves. With other people. Right. And we have the, right. we have the gift and the curse of having to do that or else we will die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Lucky us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
You know, another thing that you had mentioned, um, I know Bryce has said this in other episodes that we um, ask our guests if they'd be so kind to fill out some some forms before they come in and just to talk, yeah. mention a few things that, that might be interesting to talk about. And yeah. so I'm just going to draw from that. And um, okay. one of the things that you had mentioned was the, um, the criminalization and just that conversation, which is, you know, enormous and not a light yeah. one. And, um, you know, not everyone's going to agree on it, but just from, I think so many of these conversations that can be heavy and challenging to hear it from the clinical perspective, from someone who works, um, you know, almost, it's, all, it's almost an objective opinion, you know, it, that, that, that's really helpful to hear. So I would just love to hear what you have to say about that. I might interject my sure. own opinion. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we I, we can get hung up on terms. Uh, yeah. a decriminalization. Uh, you know, nobody should be have to serve jail time. You may do some terrible things, which there, you know, then society takes steps to reprimand you. Mm. But you shouldn't be criminalized because you have an addiction. Uh, and I mean that for hard drugs as well as everything else. Not prosecuting people because they do they do drugs or drink is a key thing. I mean, look 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 at what we do with al- alcohol. You get you're in trouble if you're driving intoxicated. Okay, that's different. Now you're putting other people at risk. And, yeah. You know, you, uh, you need treatment and you need to stop doing that. You know, you don't get thrown in jail usually, uh, for drinking. And, you know, nobody should for all the other drugs either. On the other hand, I I have people who get confused. You you know, they're smoking huge amounts of this unbelievably powerful marijuana. And they'll say to me, well, it's legal. Or I I have a medical card. And that's that's just the beginning of the conversation. If Mm -hmm. If it's doing them harm, in, in their roles, professionally, personally, family-wise, mental health-wise, then yeah. that those are the issues, not whether it's legal or not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's just another way that we get, I, I guess I could just speak for myself, like, yeah. could be dishonest with myself where I was like, well, drink alcohol is legal, so it's okay. And like, but I, I would have found a way to give myself permission to do that no matter what. The legality just happened right. to be the easy one to reach for. Right. Right. Uh, and of course, cigarettes are legal, mm-hmm. and they, they kill more people than all the other drugs combined. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, right. It's just amazing, right? That the the cigarette companies, right? They're just like any other pusher. It's uh, wild, right? Uh, it, it's so disturbing. Yeah. Uh, though we've made progress, we've made progress there, but they did a good job hooking a lot of young people now on these vapes. Oh my gosh, uh, I know. They're like cotton candy flavored. <laughs> right, right. Not for kids. Right. Future, future customers. I know, exactly. Uh, my gosh. Yeah. What yeah. do you think about, this is, I, are you familiar with Holly Whitaker? Um, no, I'm not. She wrote a book called Quit Like a Woman. Um, oh, I've heard this. Yeah. I haven't read it, but I, I, I heard about that. It's a good one. It's, I, man, when I was, I mean, when I was in the throes of trying to get sober and then spending days in bed because I had yet again failed to get sober and I, you know, just desperately listened to podcasts and read blogs and anything I'd get my hands on from people who had walked this path and were just like, you know, putting breadcrumbs of hope out there. And that was back when she had a blog called Hip Sobriety and it was enormously helpful. And she had a podcast Uh called Home and just could go on and on about the, the, just what a gift it is that I'm a person that has that's on a podcast right now because it was so helpful. But she Mm -hmm. um, eventually took all that work and years and years of studying and and working with folks um, who had experienced substance use disorder and wrote this book that is all about just like the alcohol industry and, you know, kind of specifically as it applies to um, Mm -hmm. women and women's bodies, but just in general, really compares alcohol to like big alcohol to big tobacco. And, you know, I think her hope was that someday maybe they would be looked at similarly where it's like, well, yeah, this is, you know, legal because nobody's trying to make this, you know, do what you want with your own body, but like informed consent, you know, like I, I certainly didn't know the first time I drank that it's an actual addictive substance that can like cause cancer. You know, I mean, I knew that, you know, ruined some people's lives, but, um, I don't know. What do you think about that comparison? 
So interesting. I think there's I think there's a lot of truth to it. I don't generally think about that, but you're right. I should check that book out. Uh, it's a good one. Yeah. She's got a lot of a lot of like well researched information in there. And it's yeah. also a really big thick book. So I'm not gonna tell you that I've read the entire thing, but I listened to most of the audio book. It was a good one. <laughs> well, you know, most people don't know that women suffer the ravages of alcohol uh to a much greater extent than men. Uh, it's telescoped, you know, the amount of time of heavy drinking that will do a, a woman's brain and body damage is significantly less than for a man, just on average. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the amount is much less that women need to take in to suffer physical and mental consequences. That's kind of a hidden fact. That's a hidden set of facts that... Yeah. People don't 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 know, and you know. So I I it's part of educating uh, my patients is to talk about this and to help help people to see as as they're struggling. You know, the they'll say, "Well, a bottle of wine isn't that much, really, is it, doctor?" And I'm like, "Well, you know." And then we go in to start talking about yes, <laughs> for 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 yeah. everyone that is quite a bit to take down, and for a woman in particular. Uh, yeah, it, it has its consequences that are all too strong and all too rapid. Do you see a marked difference on who seeks out the kind of help that you offer, the kind of like help with substance use disorder that that you've that you've experienced? I'm not sure about like that. I, 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 I can tell you something that's kind of uh, interesting, and that is the inpatient world, the detox units. Men are are, tr are, are much more comfortable in those units than women. I, I really started taking that to heart and really trying to understand that in the last years that I was working in those units. The last place I was at was McLean Hospital in, in Boston. You know, the men, they, they were comfortable. But I mean, if you asked their satisfaction with treatment, they were very satisfied. They thought it was great. And you asked women, it was much less. And I, was, and I, we really had to start asking ourselves, why is that? Like, what are we doing wrong? Partially, you know, the men come in, they ask for help a lot more. The units are, you know, can be male dominated as far as the numbers. Mm -hmm. Giving women their own track, giving them yeah. their own unit, giving them their own safe space to get help because they are they are so vulnerable uh, in the early going uh, to aggression, to predation, to... We just have to acknowledge that we don't do as good a job with women in those units as we do with men. And we also have to be aware of this and try to find ways to understand that, to make them more comfortable, uh, to make it a safer space for them so that more will come in for help. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, I mean, just in general, medicine was studies are done on men, you know, like so much medication mm -hmm. is out there for men. Disease processes mm -hmm. are studied in men's bodies and not as much in women's mm -hmm. bodies. Like women's health just in general is just a less mm -hmm. studied area. So yeah. I wonder yeah. if that's, if we're just, if there's just a lag. There's a lag. Things are changing. When I was a medical student a <laughs> hundred thousand years ago, <laughs> uh, there were very few women in the class. Yeah. That has changed uh, so dramatically that now there are more women than men wow. uh, in, in, in the medical school classes, right? It's, That's exciting. It's, 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 yeah, it's unbelievable. And now, you know, when you go to see an ob guy, you know, the majority are women. Yeah. Uh, whereas when I was young, they were all men mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. So, you know, these changes are happening. And yeah. it'll become that the people running these units will not be, you know, some old white guy. Uh, it'll be uh, uh, it'll be women. That's going to help, yeah. but but we can't wait for that. It, yeah. You know that that that's already happening, and it's 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 all good. But we need to look at it. You know, whoever's running the units, we have to figure out how do we make this work better for women. I don't have all all the answers. That's for sure. Uh, I just I just am acutely aware that we we had to work really hard to make it more comfortable and more sustainable for for women. The whole staff, the physicians, nurses, all of us uh, constantly needed to, ra to raise our game 
to, to, to be able to treat everyone. I would say that, that awareness and just like having the, I don't know, to care enough and to also have the courage to like ask the question and to like say out loud, like even into a microphone right here, that like that there is yeah. more work to be done. Like that's how it yeah. starts. And yes. and to, to hear that from from you who's been in this field for so many years and you know that, that you have all the knowledge that you have to be like, I don't know yet. Like, I don't know. Yeah. And it's something we yeah. need to work on. Like that's, I don't know. For, for me, that makes me you feel know, really hopeful. I can tell you when I first heard it, I was a much, you know, we, when we first started doing these patient satisfaction surveys and then we first started breaking them down by yeah. gender and I saw that women were rating as much lower. Of course, at first I was defensive. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't open to it. It um, took a while. So, but, but here we, we are. We can change. Yeah. We can change. I mean, well, yeah. And thank goodness you think that because yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a big part of your role. <laughs> well, Michael, right. I know we're, we're getting to time and I can't even begin to thank you for enough for this conversation and um, yeah. wish we could talk a lot longer. Maybe we'll, we might have to do this again because I'm sure Bryce would have got, would have questions that I never could even think of. He's, he's the question guy. Okay. But before we wrap up, I wanted to um, give you the opportunity to, you know, give a plug for the work that you're doing now with Talkiatry, um, you know, where people can yeah. find you and your work. Yeah, Talkiatry is a fascinating platform. They're really trying to make it easier for people to uh, get help and people access that platform through a million ways. But, uh, you know, uh, I've never tried, but if you go <laughs> online and you can find Talkiatry and you go through <laughs> ZocDoc and they go through all these different ways, you just boom, you make an appointment with someone who you see who's licensed in your state, make sure that the, uh, that Talkiatry takes your insurance, mm -hmm. right? The goal of it is to try to provide people care on their insurance. And, and get them care quickly and get them good care. It's not a platform for everything. It, 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 yeah. it, there's many, many kinds of folks who really are not, it's not the ideal platform for them, this telepsych stuff. But there's a, a significant swath of human beings who are looking for help that can easily access it this way. It still costs, you know, everybody, you don't know it till you're doing it. You have a deductible, you have a copay. Mm -hmm. It still costs people money. It's not like it's for free, right. but it's at least it's not just paying out of pocket the exorbitant rate. Yeah. And even very new psychiatrists will charge and therapists. It's, it's a way of getting care. Yeah, that's incredible. And in your home, like the comfort to be able to have that, to be able to do it from your phone or your computer. Like, I mean, even if it's just one barrier that it's taken away, driving to someplace, yeah. like that's an enormous yeah. barrier. That's yeah, a big deal. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, I, I, I find it uh, very rewarding, and I think the patients are finding it very helpful. It's cool. It's cool. I, I'm loving it. Well, we'll be sure to link um, Techiatry in the show notes. You know, cool. we always ask uh, this one question at the end of all of our episodes, yeah. and this has been a different kind of episode because it wasn't a um, recovery story that we, that we so often hear, but I would love to ask you mm -hmm. this question. Anyways, yeah. if you could pull back the veil of time and yeah. send a message, just some words that you know now that maybe you back in time might benefit from, what might mm -hmm. those words be? Don't give up. Do not stop treatment. Uh, just keep going back, keep going back, keep trying. It just, it can take endless number of, I've had people who needed just, I'm not even going to mention the number of times that they needed to come in just for detox, never mind for getting into recovery. Those of us who are addicted to cigarettes, like how many times does it take you to quit? You know, it's just endless, endless. And then you relapse and then you quit and you're and it just goes on and on. And, uh, but as long as you stay in treatment, as long as you keep trying, you'll eventually find help. You'll eventually help yourself. Don't measure your success only by total abstinence. People forget, like, when you cut back, you've done good. You've helped yourself. You've helped your loved ones. That's a step in the right yeah. direction. You know, give yourself those kudos as you go along so that you keep trying, so that you don't just walk away and give up. It's always worth finding somebody you can trust, both lay person and professional. So you stay, stay in treatment. That's the bottom line for, for, for me. Yeah, I love that. Let's keep at it. 
You bet. Yeah, yeah there's, it's not yeah. linear. <laughs> no, it Lord is not knows. Linear. Yeah, no, <laughs> definitely not. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of folks listening are going to really benefit from that. And um, yeah, and thank you again so much for taking the time to be here and for the work that you do in this field. It's so needed and yeah. just really grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. And uh, anytime. Appreciate it so much. And for everyone listening, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Bryce will be back next week. We'll, we'll have the, 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 I was just going to say the gruesome twosome, but that's kind of a weird way to call us. Evan. Let's not do that. Um, we'll be back together once again. And in the meantime, please be sure that you subscribe if you haven't already. Um, if you could rate, review us, that is such a big help to um, have more people find the show who might need it. If uh, you found value in this show and you'd like to send it to someone, that's always a really um, big help. And also just a gift. Anytime somebody sends me a podcast and tells me that, that it's something they think I would enjoy listening to, it makes me feel really good. So please do that. Be sure you download the Phoenix app and join us in the podcast group there. Let us know what you think. And yeah, keep taking care of you and we'll see you next time. So now you're excited. Bryce, Liz, how do I get involved with the Phoenix? Well, my friend, it is super simple. We actually have an app. Head over to the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store or look in the show notes of this podcast, wherever you're listening to or watching this podcast and go download the Phoenix app. The Phoenix app makes it so easy to find classes that are near you or to access our virtual class schedule where you can hop on from the comfort of your home. You can also join our groups and have a conversation with someone from the Phoenix community from anywhere in the world. Please make sure that you join the podcast group where you can connect with Bryce and I and other listeners. Everything that you need is in the show notes. You can also head to our website at www.thephoenix.org. And maybe while you're there, you click the volunteer tab and get even more involved.